Um, this chapter, I'm Henk Ovink, I'm Director General for Spatial Planning and Water Affairs in the Netherlands. Um, also will be Senior Advisor to your Secretary, Sean Donovan, in his task of uh, uh, the Hurricane Sanding Rebuilding Task Force for uh, the rest of the year. Uh, so I'll be back uh, a little more often. Um, and that's very, it's not a coincidence that this part of the debate is about water. Um, so this is about water and public space, of course, but the emphasis is water. Uh, in the catalog, in the, the brochure of the conference, it says urban planners and designers have begun to envision public space as more than places of enjoyment and democracy. In a world in which coastal and river cities are increasingly susceptible to floods, attributable to the effects of climate change, cities are positioning parks and plazas as places where water can come and go without permanent damage to the urban infrastructure. Is this a, this a fad or a meaningful part of the solution? I have two designers, although they will state probably differently, uh, a landscape architect and an urban designer from both sides of the ocean, from the Netherlands and from the US, to give us the broad picture. Gina Wirth, designer and project manager at SCAPE, landscape and urban design practice based in New York City. She's a lead designer for projects that link research and practice, including Petrochemical America, a visual study on the impacts of petrochemical production in southern Louisiana, and Oyster Texture, a proposal for climate change adaptation exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in 2010. Gina has taught at Columbia University, GSAPP, and the Rutgers University School of Environment and Biolog Bio Biological Sciences. She was the recipient of the Charles Elliott Traveling Fellowship from the Harvard Graduate School of Design in 2009. We're very welcome to have you here. And my second, my first speaker actually is Florian Boer, founding partner of the Urbanisten, the Urbanists, a firm that connects global themes to local improvement of public space. The Urbanisten is involved in climate proofing Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Dordrecht. And Florian is leading research and design studios on the water-related transitions and water resilience of these cities. He's the inventor of the concept of the water square, square a floodable urban public recreational space currently under construction in Rotterdam. Boer earned his degree in environmental design from the Eindhoven University of Technology, where he studied public space design and its behavioral effects in order to provoke involvement and participation. He teaches at the Delft University of Technology and the Amsterdam and Rotterdam Academies of Architecture. So we almost start. I state all issues being ecological, economic, social or cultural have a spatial impact. And this spatial impact makes planning and design so important because it gives us the opportunity to engage and actually influence the effects, but moreover influence the origins uh, of the issues at stake. So if we design and organize and plan ourselves in a meaningful, resilient way, we can actually not only make better place, make better cities, make better rural and urban landscape, but we can actually influence the start of, of the issues at stake, at their roots. One of them is water. Water is the gray line between economy and ecology. And the impact of water on the public realm is more than a beautification thing. Is that, you know, we all like water, uh, we all like our fountains. No, water is an essential part of our um, um, urban and rural society. It's in the sense of uh, climate change vital. Without water in our cities, um, the cities will heat up. Without uh, thinking about water, we don't know what to do with the, the changing effects of climate change on our water. We have longer periods of droughts and longer periods of heavy rain. Uh, so the amount of the water during a whole season, it's more or less the same, uh, but it's concentrated more. Uh, so we have to deal with this issue of water and public space, the public realm is one of them. And I'm very curious to hear what Florian uh, has to say um, and then we'll move over uh, to Gina. Florian. Good afternoon. Um, 
Hank, thank you for the introduction. Gerald, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm really, really honored to, uh, to talk a little on uh, our uh, subject. Can I have the slides, please? Or do I have to press a button? Um, I'm actually mainly going to talk about um, one concept and one project, but I will need some uh, time explaining um, whoops, the timer, yep. uh, explaining some of the, the, the context uh, of it. The title we got from Gerald to examine is Can Public Space Hold Water? Well, I think it's actually pretty easy to answer that. It already does, but then in an involuntarily manner. All over the world, Delta cities actually suffer from severe storms and public fla places flood and even more, uh, cause more damage. And I think actually if we don't want this domain actually only to be annexated by engineers making solutions, I think as a designer we should formulate answers to this as well. In Rotterdam, which I will be talking about uh, for, for the rest of my speech, we got the same kind of problems, but just in a little bit less intense manner than you might uh, imagine on other places in the world. That doesn't make it in, uh, an issue to be taken less seriously, but it allows us to make some nuances in the type of solutions that we make. And I think that's kind of interesting because it allows us also to examine a little bit more. To give you a little bit of an idea, we got 30 3.5 inches of rain annually, and as Hank already stated, uh, uh, the rain is increasing in intensity and in, uh, in its volume. And of course, this is also immediately related to climate change, but I think actually I want to uh, focus my uh, talk today on specifically the rain issue, because if I also have to talk about water safety, I think I'll need another 20 minutes actually to explain all that. To give you an idea, actually, the city of Rotterdam basically is kind of built up like this. Uh, we have actually deep polders in which the city is built. Um, the groundwater actually goes up into open water, which is pumped out into uh, subsystems and then pumped out into uh, the river, which brings it to the North Sea. Now, needless to say, of course, that actually whenever it rains heavily and whenever this uh, system is pressured, that this is a vulnerable uh, system and we, can't, we have to come up with smart solutions. At the same time, you could also say the best places in the city are next to the water. The water is really an asset. It's beautiful, it's nice to be around, it's playful, it's an enemy and a friend, and I think actually being both makes it really also interesting. I want to introduce you to a historical figure actually in Rotterdam history. This man was an engineer and an urban planner, he was called Rose, and he actually made uh, a plan in uh, 1850 that was also executed when there was no sewage system to relieve the city of its dirty water and to make a sewage system and make an overflow actually into open water, which was on the sites, which generated excellent places for expansion, quality housing, and more on. And I think what is really interesting about this approach that he actually showed that you can solve a practical problem by introducing also new quality of space. And I think actually this is a precedent that we have to follow. Therefore, I would say, can public space hold water? It's not about sacrificing space in our cities to solve climate problems, but it should be seen as an opportunity to improve the quality of our public space, involve our cities' communities, to do both public space and the climate problem at the same time. I think that's a great opportunity we have to uh, take. So the main question would be, how can we reuse, how can we use water to create better public spaces? And that's actually what I want to talk about. In my opinion, there's five points, and I will actually go through them in my, uh, in my lecture. We can solve problems actually where they occur. By doing so, we can add new public space topologies to the spectrum. We can involve communities and help them help to create awareness. We can differentiate usability and offer more diversity for use in our cities. And of course, we can do more with the same amount of money. Note, I'm not saying actually we can save money. This would be, this is the city center of Rotterdam where we actually kind of uh, uh, mounted in the total task of the water, uh, the total water task. This is currently built up area and we said like almost one third of the city you would have to turn into water if you wanted to solve the problem. This is of course just to show the magnitude. 
But talking about figures only doesn't get us anywhere. And I think actually that's what the policymakers understood very well. Rotterdam is divided in three water boards that are responsible actually for the maintenance actually of the water and keeping the, the impact actually uh, to, uh, uh, to reasonable levels, you could say. And the municipality of Rotterdam, these th four parties actually established a water plan, plan in 2007 in which they defined that solving the problem, the water problem, should also be an improvement of the spatial quality of the city. So you could say they listened to Rosa very well. And they also understood that figures are just there actually to set the task, but not actually to dominate the entire scene. Because you can discuss about figures for ages and not solve any problem at all. So we said, actually, let's make the task smaller so you can deal with it easily. You can actually integrate it into the existing space the city offers, and you can face it more easily as well. Another contextual thing you have to know is we have a mixed sewage system. That's, of course, the inheritance we had of this Mr. Rose. And when that system is actually reaching a tax, normally it goes actually to the sewage treatment plant. But when it's overflowing, it's overflowing in the open water system of the city. And actually in 1850 that was fine, but nowadays actually we don't accept that anymore. And moreover, of course, when it's totally full, the quality of water actually spilling over into the street is not very nice as well. So the idea is actually quite simple, is to add a typology which allows you to store water in an existing neighborhood by transforming the existing mixed sewage system into a split sewage system and have the water actually run off to either open water or this public space. And this public space, as we call it, is a water square, which should mainly just flood when it rains and actually can be used differently when it's not raining. And it sounds maybe a little bit too simple to be true, but it's actually just saying Instead of putting all the money in new pipes underground, we should be able to add new public space quality because the stormwater collection, and although it might feel that it always rains in Rotterdam, but it's actually just 10% of the time that it's effectively used. And 90% of the time, you can do some other stuff with it. You can do actually use it as dry public space. Thus, we think you can do more with the same amount of money. And just to see the potential of the idea, we upscaled it to the entire city and said, like, what if you could actually turn the entire inner city fabric to do so? And this then would be how it works. There's a separated system, actually, that brings, collects the water and brings it to a central place. And as you can see, there are more compartments here. They could gradually flood from one place to the other as the amount of rainfall increases. And of course, I have to say, this is just one of the many solutions that you can come up with, but this is a solution that's there for the most problematic areas, dense urban areas that are already existent and that you would like to transform into more sustainable areas with split sewage systems. And that is something you can do actually just piece by piece, and you don't have to kind of like expand the entire system. And of course, when there's more space around, you make open water. That's, of course, much easier to do and also cheaper. But when the, the city fabric is dense, we now build giant underground storage basins to flood with, uh, sewage, uh, with uh, sewage overflow. And 90% of the time, they're empty and they cost millions. And we have, of course, the green roofs, which are beautiful, but a very small scale solution. And there's, of course, greening the streets. But I'm not going to tell anything about that because the, the Netherlands can use something, learn something from the United States here. So I'll just focus more on this one concept, which we call the water square. And the idea is, like I said, a central place that can flood from time to time and then runs off into the open water. And why is that interesting? I think it offers new possibilities for usage. You can design it in such a way that the flooding becomes interesting. The water square changes with the weather and also brings it closer to people, I would say, in that sense. After the rain, the square can become turned into little moats where you can jump around with, where you can play with. So you could say it's, it's a playful place, especially knowing that a lot of rain occurs 
the intensity is increasing in the end of the summer. So you could say, uh, just after the rain is gone, it's great to go outside and play in there. And of course, this is a once in two years uh, uh, um, uh, um, situation. You could use it also, uh, well, for more adventurous kids, but of course for the smaller kids, you would have to really make sure that there's a, a, a way of blocking the access and parental uh, surveillance will be necessary in these places. Something about the hygiene, because I, uh, I was actually also asked not to only talk about uh, the upsides. Our uh, municipal health service um, has had contamination levels uh, of uh, stormwater uh, uh, um, uh, examined together with the University of Utrecht. And they found these levels, at least for local collection, acceptable because they allow, uh, they allow slight levels of contamination. They actually sh have the opinion and also uh, uh, official policy that slight levels of contamination, if a child swallows, can help, help to build up the defensibility of the child. And of course, it's a typical, you have to share this opinion in order to be able actually to do this type of solution. This is the first uh, uh, project that's being uh, realized. Uh, we didn't design it, the, 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 the city planning department did. We only did some uh, uh, advising on this. But I think it's really interesting because here you can see this was the opening uh, of, uh, of the square and uh, this was water actually kind of gushed deliberately into that. And of course, children immediately started playing in that. You have to know, of course, this can just flood to a very small level and there's immediate parental uh, uh, surveillance around it because it's immediately bordered by housing blocks. This is the one we are actually designing or we designed and uh, we uh, were actually building. This is the big variant and as you can see it's a bit more uh, 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 upscale. We also tried actually to, to search for how big we could go in that sense and I think it would be interesting, I want to share a little bit with you, um, not about only about how it works, but also, also how we conceive the entire idea. Um, well, this is actually, the, uh, this is where the project where Christian was talking about ends. As you can see, we're, we're actually operating uh, just next to it. So uh, we're, we're kind of uplifting the entire part of the city together, you could say. This is a, a, a large school there's hundreds and hundreds of students up there, and this is the uh, existing uh, um, uh, appearance, uh, or was the existing appearance of the square. And it's surrounded by a modernist building, actually, for one of the most Rotterdam most uh, uh, um, famous architects, which I think has uh, made a beautiful building, but did not actually consider a relation to public space. To be honest, even he said, Sporting outside of the school can be considered as non-urban and a very provincial activity. This was the 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And you could say in that sense, the public space, not so much the building, but the public space can, can actually have a revaluation of how these places are being used these days. For that, actually, we started a very intense participatory trajectory. I'll explain this in pieces so you don't have to read the entire scheme, but this is more or less what we tried to do. We actually set up three workshops, and uh, we asked everybody to participate to think along with us. And we started actually with presenting this comic book. We made a comic book about this entire idea I was just talking about. And we explained that this was the best way to get the place improved and asked them actually who wanted to think along with us about how the water square would look. And this was just actually explaining the idea. Then we actually invited, from every organization we invited people, and we made three workshops. The first workshop, all participants sat around the table. We had four groups, and we asked them to think about from their own interests as much as possible to what they wanted to do in the place, which atmosphere would go with it, and which role water would play. Obviously, we provided these cards. And we gave them an empty drawing of the place and asked, like, position these around. If you think, like, what would you like to do there? What atmosphere you need to support this? And which role can water play? Obviously, not all cards would fit, so they had to choose. And we had them present it to each other. After doing that, we had a very clear idea, actually, on what activities were desired. The bigger the card, the more vote it got what atmosphere would go along with it, and the role what wa which water could play. And obviously, actually, this was the least 
uh, uh, clear for people, but the thing is actually it got them thinking about the concept in the first place, and I think that was really nice because everybody started to become really enthusiastic about rainwater flowing over the square, being visible and audible, so that's, you could say it's a great start for you as a designer to work on such a topic. In the second workshop, we worked out three proposals and brought them back to them and had them uh, choose one and convince the others to do the same. In these three uh, proposals, we had water organize um, the configuration differently, but in every one, the, amount, the, the type of activities were exactly the same. So because they were the same, they talked about other things, like what role of water they thought was, it was interesting and the social configuration. And they had a lot of discussion about a subdivided place where every group could claim its own territory and everybody sharing the same space. And it turned out that actually they liked the second one the best because of its aesthetic qualities and coherence and also for the water, and this one for the activities. So we actually merged both together and brought, uh, turned it into a first design and discussed it with them and had them sticker it. What do you like? What can be improved? and what should be added. And likewise, we optimized the square to the final design, in which you can see three places for real active use. These are existing trees. We uh, connected the greenery over the place to make more intimacy, to subdivide the space actually in more different places. And of course, these three places, these three basins are Oh, sorry, this is the scheme actually, the, uh, the activity scheme that goes with it, in which we try to designate subculturally different areas for active use, and which served at the same time also as stormwater storage. There's three basins, two collecting local water and one collecting from the larger neighborhood. The local basin is collecting from its immediate surrounding and from the adjacent roof. And the roof actually is being spilled over into what we call a rain well to get it audible and, oh, it says three, so, and, um, and visible onto the square, running into large stainless steel gutters actually, bringing it to the, uh, to the undeep basins, both collecting, uh, locally collecting storm water and one big basin actually collecting the water from the wider area in which a delay uh, system is being uh, added, and when it spills over, it's uh, again audibly and visually attractive, we think. It divides the space actually in three different types of basins, but also three types of uses. Green islands with wheel slopes around, a central place where sports can be, uh, can be executed, and a smaller enclosed space with a stage on an island. And that's the nice thing about the water. It, 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 it needs height differences, it needs depth, and it has actually also allows you uh, to use it in an, uh, in an informal way. Stairs and slopes in different sizes and materials. And this is how it could look. Blue is actually where all the water goes. The message is pretty simple. And the stainless steel is actually uh, uh, the means that transports it there on and off the square. Something extra about the height difference. I think what is interesting, the big deep basin is a sports uh, field where you can play basketball and soccer, which was very desired actually by the area, uh, by, by the community around it. And also sports teachers wanted to actually play on the square actually when it's, uh, uh, um, uh, when it's sunny or when it's dry, I think actually it's already enough. And one of the things we could do with the water square because it has to collect so much water we can actually sink the space into the ground and with a little railing actually, it's enough to catch all the balls. And instead of having a sports cage, which always defines the place outside and inside and breaks the space, we could actually use this to not only not disrupt the space, but also actually by opening it on the sides, become really a central place in it. And this is of course also the place that's actually being built. I'm rounding off now. I think one thing is interesting, this, this is all different types of governmental money actually that we uh, use to finance the place. But I think it's good to know that 20% of it actually was paid by the water boards who normally don't literally invest in public space. 60% um, was 
paid by the municipality and of which actually 40% is out of infrastructural money and 20% is actually just public space money. And 20% is done by the European uh, Union and uh, Henk uh, also sponsored some parts. So you could say all together, this is what we try to do, like investing in public space should be also investing in water storage or water storage is investing in public space. And it also meant getting different sectors together because all these technicians here that are, that are on the table, the guys that actually do these pipes normally never work with these construction guys, never work with the guys actually doing the public space, never work with the guys doing the lighting. This is a safety light. So you could say in that sense, it was int interesting actually because normally they only work subsequently after each other, somebody under the ground and somebody above the ground. They now actually had to draw the same drawing together and that was actually an interesting difficulty to be overcome. To close off, some water management facts. This is the place, this is more or less the area that it collects water from. It has to store 50 millimeters of water which is 100% of the policy goal. And that, uh, in that sense, it also withdraws it from the sewage system and relieves it accordingly. This also means, because it infiltrates and goes back into the open water, that we improve the water quality at the same time. And then this would be how it would look, a vivid place for everybody around it. And when after a good shower, some playful places and a sport field that actually we, we try to keep dry. And then of course, when it really rains heavily, this is actually the full policy goal, you could say. Thank you. I'm Gina Worth. Um, if you look on your program today, you won't actually see my name because I am standing in for Kate Orr, um, founder and principal at SCAPE Landscape Architecture. I work at SCAPE and I've been lucky enough to be invited to speak in his place this afternoon. So I am very thankful for that opportunity and to be in such talented company. Could I get the presentation up on the screen? Yes. All right, so here we are today. We are talking about water. Does public space hold water? I think Florian has very, very illustratively and beautifully described that yes, public space holds water. Um, and what I wanted to kind of add to this conversation was that it's not purely about holding water. There's a all this whole range, this whole suite of ways in which water and public space can kind of potentially overlap and interact. And I think Florian's project shows much of that. Um, but I'd also like to stress that each particular city, each particular region has its own uh, hydromorphological footprint, its own way of interacting and being shaped by the water systems that surround it. So what's necessarily a solution in Rotterdam maybe isn't a solution in Lexington, Kentucky. Maybe a different solution would be applied in Phoenix. Um, but there is so much potential in these overlaps between public space and water. So we really try to explore this in the office. Um, and I think many other designers are exploring this as well. Uh, here on the left is a series of um, more conventionally thought out public spaces, uh, parks, plazas, sidewalks, streets. And now the design world is really tackling um, how to integrate these spaces, how to think about them not only as spaces for people, but also spaces for water. Thinking about them as kind of hybrid uh, infrastructural water management landscapes. So parks might be thought of as kind of city scale infiltration basins, fields might actually be flood storage areas, uh, plazas might become water squares. I think these ideas are very rich and evocative, um, but again, are kind of very particular to the hydromorphological footprint of the place that you're working within. Um, so at, at SCAPE, we look at all these systems and I decided to talk about the overlaps between water and public space uh, through two different projects. Um, one is in Lexington, Kentucky. It's a competition that we recently won and we've begun the kind of strategic planning process on. It's called Town Branch Commons. And this project looks at inserting water into the city fabric uh, and how to generate public space from that insertion. The second project is in New York City. It's a conceptual proposal for 
uh, sea level rise and storm surge and the waterfront, and it's called oyster texture. And that kind of does the inverse or the opposite. It proposes how to extend the public realm out into the water and think about the water as something that is um, risky, but also has potential in terms of space creation. So Town Branch Commons, uh, is Town Branch is the name of the stream, but Town Branch Commons was a competition to daylight a stream throughout the middle of Lexington, Kentucky's downtown. It's like a, it's a landscape architect's dream project to work on a project like this. So we're very excited to be on it. Town Branch is actually the reason Lexington, Kentucky is in the place that it is. Uh, the, the city was founded on its banks. However, over time, this, the city has grown up over it and completely covered Town Branch. Um, it's kind of been erased from the city fabric. It's in many ways been erased from the memory of the place. Um, so the competition, which was sponsored by the Lexington DDA, and I believe Jeff Fugate was here today. If yeah, if anyone has any questions about how Town Branch is moving, please direct there. Um, but the competition was sponsored by the DDA and it was really to look at how can Town Branch be brought back into the city fabric, but also create much needed public space within downtown, making Lexington a destination um, and also making it a much more desirable place to live. So it's a very exciting concept, but then when you look at the reality of Town Branch, you see that urban water systems have their own particular challenges. Town Branch is not a river, it's a stream. Uh, it's sometimes it's, it's barely trickling and it has pollution issues and for most of its length, it's completely covered. Um, however, Lexington as a, as a region, as a county, is very inspiring. They have an urban growth boundary. They have a really well-preserved rural region, the bluegrass country, which kind of gives the identity of the city. Um, the, it's known as the horse capital of the world. So they've really understood that and its kind of legacy and protected it. Um, I think that one of the unfortunate outcomes of this is that there's very pristine uh, kind of cultural space on the periphery, but in terms of public access, it's a completely privatized space. This is not the public realm, this is the realm of million dollar racehorses. The public realm downtown is a, a very different story. Uh, I think Gerald used, you used the word marginal. <laughs> to describe the quality of uh, public space in your cost analysis. And I think we could all agree that this is truly marginal public space. It's also marginal hydrologic space. If you look, this image is showing Vine Street, which is the um, second largest street in Lexington, Kentucky. Main Street's a much more active, uh, kind of walkable retail street, but this is the second largest street. And Vine Street is literally a highway thoroughfare these are some of the largest buildings in Lexington. It's part of a kind of central business district, but it's not a walkable or friendly environment. Um, also, from, from a hydrological perspective, Town Branch exists underneath Vine Street. So you're looking at the stream course. The stream course is the street. Uh, and then you're also literally looking at the stream course below. That's the, that's the, exition of the condition of Town Branch right now. It's a, a trickle of water running through a very large concrete culvert. So you look at this and you begin to really see the challenges of thinking about how to daylight and integrate this water body into the city fabric. Um, so this, this line here, this is an aerial downtown Lexington, Kentucky here. Um, there's a convention center, Rupp Arena for basketball fans. Uh, but basically Town Branch is in culverts that are shown in these two blue lines and this is the headwaters of the stream system and it moves this way to the left of the image. And we really tried to examine the city and think about how can we integrate the water and the city in different ways responding to the kind of urban context around. So we came up with four different strategies and four different areas in which these would be applied. And we're calling them reveal, clean, carve, and connect. And, and I'll talk a little more about the plan in a minute. Um, but what we were very, uh, also very interested in is trying to figure out how to do this and also tell a story about Lexington and its kind of larger, larger environs. So we began to look at what makes Lexington, Lexington. And I think if you ask that question, uh, many of you might say horses and many of you might say bourbon, because uh, those are two very important things for identity of Lexington and Kentucky in general. Um, but actually we would come back and we would say, Karst is what makes Lexington, Lexington. And Karst is the bedrock that is below Lexington. And, and the Karst actually makes the water more basic. It makes the bourbon taste better. And it really nourishes the bluegrass that makes the horses run faster. So it is kind of this hidden key into the identity of this place that is not quite, uh, it's, it's, it's a, less, a less blunt tool for talking about Lexington. Um, but we were interested in how Karst locates in Lexington. This is Lexington. Kentucky here, you can see it's a large blue deposit of karst geology. And we're also interested in how that affects the hydrology of the place. This is what I'm talking about when I say the 
the hydromorphology of a place is very distinct and unique, and Lexington is incredibly unique because water doesn't simply flow over the surface of the land. The bedrock karst is so porous that it can simply, in some cases, flow through. So we learned this whole new vocabulary of how water and geology interacted. Um, streams became interrupted. They disappeared and reappeared at different moments along their links. Uh, sinkholes, boils, swallets, interrupted stream channels. I'll show some images of what these things are. This is an area called the Blue Hole, where an underground stream, you don't see it, suddenly appears in this large, large uh, pool of water. It, it then moves into a stream and kind of moves out of the way, disappears into a swallet, one of these moments where the water, water disappears. And there's also these moments of karst windows where the bedrock geology is exposed but fractured, so you have views and glimpses into the water body, underground stream below. Um, you know, man has kind of intervened in these situations and, and build structures and systems out of them. And then uh, this is one of my favorites, the sink, where a flowing stream will literally run into what looks like an impermeable rock face simply to disappear as it's moving along. And then boils is where a water is actually forced up below a, uh, a, a, more, a more impervious surface and due to the water pressure behind it. it. It's like a naturally occurring fountain. But then again, we have the reality check. This is the urban boils. <laughs> this is what we're faced with, uh, a kind of stormwater system and sewer system that are at capacity and overflowing in times of major rain events. So many, many of the same issues we're in with discussing. Um, but we really, we really found opportunity in the karst hydrology and how we could think about overlapping these spaces and how we could think about uh, interpreting the karst hydrology in an urban setting, in an urban sense. So there are moments when we thought maybe we could reveal the stream channel, maybe we could clean it and not actually reveal the culvert below. Maybe there are moments we could create karst windows and actually pull back and peel and peek into the underground stream that's constructed. And there are moments where we could maybe think about uh, the stream system, the water system is a kind of connective tissue that links neighborhoods but is also a, a kind of daylit channel. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly show some images about the project. There's not time to talk in great detail uh, about the specific conditions. But Reveal really looks at the stream channel, um, revealing it, making it a daylit channel, giving it a meander, allowing it to have room to actually uh, create the different habitats that are normally associated with stream channels, um, riffles marshes, uh, wetlands. But we also saw opportunity in this, in this particular por portion of the site. This is, a, this is Rupp Arena and the Convention Center, and it's kind of, right now, this is a large, a huge surface parking lot. Lexington, Kentucky doesn't have a recreational park kind of located in the downtown. So if you want to walk your dog, or you want to go for a bike ride, or you want to play a game of baseball, you have to get in a car and move, move outside the city. So we, we saw a real opportunity for this, and we thought the river could be a shaper of that space. Sorry, the stream. The stream could be a shaper of that space. So not only would the stream begin to frame different types of uh, recreational rooms along its length, it would have different habitat rooms along the spine, but it would also serve as flood control infrastructure for the particular zone, which is located completely within the floodplain. So an image of uh, the kind of back space, which is actually the view that you get coming from the airport, and an image of what that could be with the daylight stream channel uh, kind of coming through. Clean is in a much, much different context. Um, this, is, this is where our strategy becomes much less linear and much more pocketed. I think that's an imp important, important piece. Uh, clean really looks at how to leave the culvert, how to leave some water in there, but how to really treat all of the stormwater runoff as the water runoff, as Hound Branch. Like the, the whether it's in the culvert or whether it's actually above the ground and hasn't gotten there yet, we're trying to consider those one and the same. So we looked at a series of filter gardens that could be inserted into um, right now what is a large one-way street, making it a two-way street and adding, adding uh, infiltration basins and treatment basins to filter the water, um, but also creating new types of public space that are much more kind of intimately connected with already successful parts of the city um, and not so linear that they completely block access and completely uh, prevent um, prevent movement within. Carve is in a, an area that has a kind of emerging theater district, so we were trying to really amplify that program. And with the, the Carve zone, we were really looking at how to reveal parts of the Hound Branch water coming from the culvert below, pump it, infiltrate it, uh, treat it, and send it back into the system, and, and maybe have areas that were kind of discreet from that and separate and potable water where people could really um, not, not be injured if they drank the water. So 
this area is like a much larger uh, kind of urban plaza, and I think we had talked about the, the benefits of, of heavily programming certain spaces. I think Lexington has some interesting parks, but it has a, a programming problem in much of its space. Uh, so we really looked at a kind of creating a really heavily, heavily programmed area uh, for different ages, young and old. And then finally, Connect began to look at how to uh, connect neighborhoods, how to think about areas that aren't intimately downtown, but areas um, that have maybe been more marginalized or maybe more separate, and how to bring them in to that, that kind of vitality, that kind of downtown activity. So uh, there's two, two kind of neighborhoods here that have been historically separated from each other. There's a piece of rail and way infrastructure that's blocked development, and there's a very fast road. So we saw water as this thing that could potentially unite these neighborhoods, but also act as a spine for more opportunistic or more um, user-generated community programming. So there's a community facility we're tying into and some uh, community gardening we're proposing in this area. So I think there is the idea, the idea behind this project was that it's four different ways of dealing with water, um, but it but it tries to create place-specific solutions that don't rely upon the entire system being built. So you could build one part of this and move on, or you could build the, the middle part and still have a kind of generative urban space without having to uh, have it all done on day one. So Oyster Texture is, is a, a very different project. It's a very different context. Um, it's a project for, for New York City, and it was commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art for the exhibition rising currents, and the, the, the kind of the task we were given with this project was how can you look at New York City's waterfront in the face of climate change and design a more adaptive, soft infrastructure for protection. So um, our proposal, we were asked to look at the site of uh, Red Hook, which is here. This is all in the borough of Brooklyn, uh, Sunset Park, and we became very interested in this little triangle of shallow water, which is called the Bay Ridge Flats. We started the project by kind of looking, looking back to see what happened there earlier. So this is our image from 1776 where we were really thinking about, uh, we, we did some historical map research and really thought about what kinds of ecosystems existed there. And you can see it's this, this mosaic of ecosystems. There's shallow water, there's soft water, there's calm water, um, and there's, there's all these different uh, habitats coexisting. And then this is the same footprint. You look at what's happened today. Land has been filled, and that, that kind of gradient from hard to soft has been turned into a line that divides hard and soft. Um, and you can also see on this map that uh, basically the areas that are shown in the kind of flooding scenario. This project was done before Hurricane Sandy, so it's all, um, you know, it can, it can be critiqued in that, in that respect. Um, but you can see here that the lines of the flood for potential category one through four hurricanes um, actually correspond quite closely with the historic lines of wetlands and areas that have been landfilled. So in this project, we, we, didn't, we decided not to try to solve every single problem. We decided to think about how do we address certain problems within this uh, climate change scenario. So we wanted to address the issue of water quality because we have to think not only about how much water is coming into a neighborhood or uh, how, how fast it's coming, but also what is the quality of the water? Is it okay to receive that in your basement? Is it okay to have uh, interaction with that? We also wanted to think about storm surge, which is literally the atmospheric pressure that drives the storm, but it's also composed of wave action. So storm surge in New York and Sandy was much higher because of the amount of waves and the amount of wind that was generated than it would have been if it was uh, simply just the surge. And we also wanted to think about sea level rise. So we came up with a couple of different strategies to begin to, to begin to address these, and we thought to try to figure out how we could make them um, more of a hybrid system. So uh, for water quality, we really looked at that, that same kind of uh, ecological mosaic of oysters, eelgrass, and mussels, and also marshlands that you saw in the first image. Uh, and we also looked at um, creating those as a kind of protective reef, what we're calling the Palisades Reef, to deal with the storm surge, and not deal completely with the, the water level rise, but deal with the uh, kind of impacts of waves, attenuating waves. Um, and then for sea level rise, we looked at um, a kind of water-based community, a way of a way that a community could actually accept water as opposed to reject water. So I'm, I'm actually not gonna talk very much about the Gowanus portion of the proposal because there's not, not enough time. But we, we were very interested in the oyster as this uh, filtration device, as a biological filtration device. Uh, oysters filter certain contaminants from the water column. Um, not all contaminants, it's really important to note. Uh, but they do filter nitrogen and phosphorus, which are very, very abundant in our water sources, so much so that it uh, reduces the 
ecological vitality of the space. And oysters used to have a huge presence in New York City. There used to be enough oysters to cover the entire, uh, to filter the entire harbor, um, I think in a matter of days. They were over harvested, water quality levels uh, became so bad before the Clean Water Act passage in the 70s that oyster populations were decimated. So people are looking now at how to restore these things back in the harbor. But what we were very interested in oysters was because they have wave attenuation capabilities. Oysters agglomerate into reef systems and uh, they, they have the ability to uh, buffer and protect shorelines, which is what they do in natural ecosystems. And they also are a keystone species and can provide the, the kind of base habitat for a whole host of other, of other species and people. Um, this is the kind of life cycle image of oyster, how it grows, and we thought to apply that to the actual uh, geography of Red Hook and Sunset Park and the Gowanus Canal. So we had a, a kind of concept about oyster cultivation and oyster growth uh, that was kind of simultaneously reciprocal. They were, they were related and linked. So what you see, I'm gonna talk mostly about this system here, and what you see there is uh, what we're calling the Palisades Reef, which is a protective oyster reef armature that breaks waves in the event of a storm. And that could be a storm that happens every five years, 100 years, or 500 years. Uh, and this is a kind of diagram of what that wave attenuation oyster reef might begin to look like. Um, you can see waves are actually broken lower in the tidal column, in the water column, you break them at the base and then they crash and we have a, a kind of subtidal system, which is mostly oysters, that moves to an intertidal system, which is probably going to be mostly mussels because they can survive that environment, going to a, a kind of more island or archipelago kind of system. But these, these three layers really build up into a, a kind of ecologically functioning reef system. To think about the kind of materials that we could begin to use for this space, we, we talked with Paul Mankiewicz from the Gaia Institute. Um, he introduced us to this material, fuzzy rope, which is used in the mussel aquaculture industry. And we also looked at pilot projects, restoration projects. These are, this is what oysters in New York City look like. They look very different than the ones that show up on your dinner plate. <laughs> um, but we looked at pilot restoration projects around the harbor to kind of come up with a palette of materials. And you can see that the, the kind of resulting image and the resulting uh, design direction was very much a woven matrix of fuzzy rope suspended on a uh, pile system and we thought it would have different different capabilities of, in terms of how it could support different types of public space and different types of ecological space. The reason oysters don't flourish in the harbor right now is that we have um, a, very, a very high amount of dredging and harbor navigation that puts a lot of sediment into the water column. So oysters really need to be suspended off the seafloor to be able to survive and flourish. That's what all the restoration projects have found. So that's the reason that our reef proposal is lifted, lifted off the seafloor. I think the other important concept here is that we are designing for the future. This project was developed before Sandy. No one really knew how fast and how intensely it was going to happen. But the idea is we could plant the seeds right now for this climate change uh, protection scenario, which would literally biologically grow along with the threat of climate change. And we also thought it had real uh, public space potential kind of in its, in its later phases to create a new kind of watery public space for New York City, uh, which, is, which is unlike anything that exists now. Um, these are just some images of how we imagine that might function. Um, areas, areas that would have less public occupation being the kind of more oystery areas and areas with the archipelagos that might be, um, have a, a water taxi or other kind of connective system to allow people to access them um, as, as shown here. I think the other really important thing here is that uh, the oyster texture proposal really looks at not only the storm scenario, but the everyday scenario. We have, as we saw in the first images, we've erased those soft shorelines and those calm shorelines from our waterfront. So the waterfront is something that has incredibly abrasive and aggressive waves. There's not a lot of space to occupy in New York City protected waters. We need more protected waters and the reef would allow that and kind of invite more people out to engage with the water um, in a more protected and safe way. These are some of the kind of activities we imagined happening, not only typical kind of recreational activities, but more, uh, farming type tech, uh, techniques or oyster gardening, oyster restoration work, um, and then some images of the, the final project. So I'll just end and say that, that both projects, I think they're, they're kind of inverses of each other and how they deal with water in public space, but both deal with water in a very generative way, but also um, really try to seriously consider the risks of introducing water in the urban environment. Thank you.
Thank you, and thanks, Florian. Um, we now know water is key. Uh, <laughs> there's no doubt about it. Uh, in public space, in our cities, uh, 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 regarding uh, um, climate change or regarding uh, our economy. Uh, I also know I only have like 10 and a half something minutes, so you are key too. Uh, but I have one question. Um, your designers and the presentations and the projects you showed are hugely complex. Um, they're uh, uh, ecologically complex, technolo technolo technology complex, there's engineers, there's politicians, there's policy makers and rules and regulations, and how do you survive? <laughs> what is these, how does design actually make a difference when it comes to the water square or when it comes to the, the two projects you showed, uh, Gina? Because before you know it, um, it's engineers or it's politics that actually make the difference. Yeah, I would, I would say that um, the design, like Adrian said last night, professional designers make a huge difference and are very important in these roles. Um, and I think with oyster texture, uh, the, the kind of difference that design made is actually just proposing this, this hybrid system, the hybridity between public space creation, ecological restoration, water filtration, and coastal protection. Like I think that there's, there's not a lot of disciplines that are able to take those different silos and combine them, and we offer the ability to kind of visualize those things. In Town Branch, I think it's very different. I think it's a question of um, design Design plays a role in kind of developing a constituency or a kind of stewardship field. It basically, we are visualizing systems or we're visualizing spaces that don't exist. We're visualizing water bodies that are underground, that no one sees, that no one can interact with. There's no, there's no stewardship group around Town Branch. There's no watershed um, conservation group around Town Branch. Something needs to be done to really bring this into collective imagination and help share that. And I think that's a, a big part of what designers do. Florian. I think, um, well, there's two things you, you asked, like, how, how do you survive? I think it, it, it starts with being, uh, uh, and I, I see the same with, with you, actually, with being persistently optimistic. You, you have to be, I guess. Because uh, I'm actually going to quote you every now and then, because you said, actually, uh, you make a solution that it's not only a storm scenario, but actually it is meant to be every day enjoyable. And I think, actually, engineers tend to not to kind of like criticize engineers for just the sake of criticizing engin engineers, but still, they, will be they, some in the they, 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 they tend to yeah. solve things, but forget actually what the result will be in everyday life. Like for instance, what has happened to, uh, 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 to New Orleans after Katrina. I know that actually one big Dutch engineering firm is actually solving the problem there right now. And at the same time, actually, you see these huge concrete walls being erected and everybody's kind of like cut off the water permanently. And I think like, is that actually the price you have to pay for being safe? So it's kind of, I think it's really, um, and I think there for that, we, we have to make a difference because actually this is our, we're, we're here actually to make space look better actually and more enjoyable. And I think, and that's you proving as well actually, so we have to move a little bit into the field of engineering also to know what we're talking about. Okay, very clear. Who? I want to collect the question. <coughs> yeah, in the back. Please state your name. Uh, I'm Vineet Dwadkar. I'm a student here at the GSD, and uh, we're working on a studio project uh, in uh, Jamaica Bay, so quite a few of us are here. Uh, one question for both of you is uh, the projects you've shared are kind of still seen as test projects. So they can be a way that policymakers, as well as the general public and designers, engineers, politicians, can all kind of, uh, we're all holding our breath and hoping that soft infrastructure uh, can do what we hope it can. Uh, what are things that you uh, are kind of looking forward to down the road of ways to keep that kind of optimism present in the face of uh, increasing kind of conflict about water, especially on coasts? And the possibility that politicians might choke up and say, we're going to build these kind of walls that might... Uh, and soft infrastructure experiments. Okay, another one. I will collect some. <laughs> no one? Well. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> First we do the optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> the testing. Sure. Um, 
I mean, I'm I'm uh, I do a, a little bit of work in Jamaica Bay. I'm very interested in Jamaica Bay, so I'm really glad that you guys are doing this video on it. Um, I I would just suggest that the question. This is something Kate has said before, so I'm trying to channel her a little bit. But it's not really a question of soft infrastructure versus hard infrastructure. It's how can we think about hybrid infrastructure. So we're we've been lucky enough to be invited to work on the. Um, the, the SUR project, the Mayor's Special Initiative for Resilience and Recovery within New York City, actually looking at these shorelines, deciding what are the problems, how can these best be addressed. Uh, and we are looking at some of these wave, wave break type scenarios. But, but the reality is soft infrastructure is not going to be the only solution. Hard infrastructure is not going to be the only solution. We have to look at these things kind of linked as a system together. Uh, we've, we've found that wave attenuation barriers can actually really help to reduce, reduce the amount of surge. But oyster texture is not a project that reduces water in neighborhoods. Neighborhoods would still flood in that scenario. They would flood with cleaner water and with calmer water. And we find that to be valuable. But the other thing they can do is they can actually reduce the levee height or the, the height of the seawall that you might actually need in if, you, if you have a situation where you need to prevent flooding, a dry scenario. So I think there's a lot of potential. You, know, you can really reduce the impact, the visual impact, the physical impact, the environmental impact of a hard infrastructure by complementing it with softer infrastructure. Um, on an even bigger scale, the city is looking at the storm surge barrier, and there's the question of how do we think about, um, how do we think about whether that's the situation or a strategy to move forward with, or do we think about kind of smaller, more dispersed coastal protection measures around the city? And I think that's also a question of hybridity. There's maybe a little bit less potential for the uh, storm surge barrier to hold other types of public space, um, and that solutions closer to the shoreline that they're protecting have the potential to interact with those communities in a more meaningful way, maybe in a recreational capacity, maybe one day in an agricultural capacity, which is what we ultimately would like to see with oyster texture is waters that we can actually harvest and eat from. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential overlaps there. I think you would also ask about uh, how we see these things moving forward, and I think just right now in the, in the climate of uh, post Sandy, everything's very much in the air, but there's a lot of ideas on the table, and the ideas that are on the table are very exciting. So, can you address these two yes. optimistic second position instead of well, seeing it institutionalized? Well, well, well I, I maybe here I would be uh, not only optimistic because I, I think actually uh, uh, testing also has something kind of uh, um, very light, and we should be aware that actually when it becomes a failure, the test, actually then it's totally gone. So I think we should be, in that sense, very uh, cautiously of what you really are going to test because there's a lot of great ideas, but still actually they might not all be very applicable or very, uh, uh, very relevant. So it's always good to generate ideas, but after that actually we should first test it with actually people like you also did actually. Um, but people who really know about it content-wise, you, so you should load your team up with experts so you make as many accomplices as possible. And then actually the testing becomes more viable. So at, at least now in Rotterdam, I'm not the only one telling the water square story. I mean, we got the health service, we got the, the water management department, we got the politicians. I mean, they're all telling the same so story because we actually worked through the experiment and we're kind of... We're determined for it to be a success. And actually only then I would actually try such a thing out. So I, I would be very careful in bringing the experiment kind of like yeah, But publicly. you need them both, eh? The, uh, the testing institutionalizes, and at yeah. the same time you want the institutionalize to break out again. So that's what you do all yeah. the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, it should not stay out of the institutional world. Uh, you have to escape once again, but you should not be afraid of the institution. That's it. Okay. One so more oyster, question. Oysters yeah. grow to dinner plates. Oh, yeah. In, uh, <laughs> two and a half years. Yeah. Just a quick answer. One last question. I don't know. There's probably a mic. Yeah. That would be better. Hi. My name is Ardam. I'm also a student here. I have a question on scale, how you choose scale, because you're working on an ur urban environment, but you're also talking about water. So do you cho choose a spatial scale based on uh, the hydro basin or the uh, urban planning scale in terms of spatial scale, but also in terms of temporal scale? Do you use the, the water cycle scale or do you use the uh, 
infrastructure life scale? That's it. It's, 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 it's a mix, mix of many things. I mean, it starts, of course, with the water management, because, um, for instance, uh, concerning Rotterdam, because it's so flat, actually, we're pretty limited in how you can actually have a, a normal, natural runoff. So there's a, there's a limitation there. The second one is, of course, is the urban scale. I, you want to relate to the environment. So in that sense, we're, we're mainly actually looking at uh, uh, what activities, in that sense, could also really relate to uh, the environment that we meet, and also very pragmatically, which area we are allowed to transform, because sometimes actually you just can't touch everything. So we have to kind of find the balance between this water management scale that actually is defining what will work, and the urban scale actually, and where we're allowed to um, to intervene, and you were actually referring to something temporal. I kind of didn't get that completely. But you, you also talk about intervening in an urban environment where the life scale of the infrastructure is maybe 50 years long or like mm -hmm. 100 years long and it's going to change. So do you include, for example, adaptability and flexibility in your design so it may change according to the patterns of the city will take? Yeah, yeah when you, when you kind of like press it down in concrete, it's kind of difficult. But the thing is actually in this case that because it's, it's, it's a kind of a small scale solution and you still have this existing system. I mean, we're not, we're not operating in, 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 in on, a, on, a, on a blank paper. So you have this existing uh, infrastructure and everything we add actually uh, makes a difference. So you could say everything we do already uh, um, helps and will be uh, effective from now on. But when you need more, you would just actually <laughs> intervene, intervene in more places. That's actually the nice thing about adding these small interventions or smaller interventions because you can actually continue adding them until actually, well, until your space is up. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add to, to kind of build on the, the temporal scale and scale issues is, is that in the office we, we try to scale very differently and jump between scales. You'll, you'll see that the oyster texture project was started by thinking about literally the scale of an oyster. How quickly does it grow to become, you know, the size that you'd see in third grade or how how, how long does it take to be produced into a, a kind of agglomerating roof system? And then with Town Branch, we really started at the regional scale and kind of looked at the larger hydrologic patterns. But it's always a matter of kind of zooming in and zooming out and really testing the scale of the project. But I think to, to talk to the temporal scale slightly is that's what really what Oyster Texture proposed, proposed to do. And, and I think it's what soft infrastructure kind of more broadly proposes to do is that it's not about um, full protection, like in the coastal protection scenario, it's not about full protection on day one. It's about setting up the kind of components or pieces or catalyzing the system to allow that, that system to kind of grow over time. So as sea levels rise, our marsh system can maybe expand. As storm surge pressures become more intense, hopefully our oyster reefs and our barrier islands can become fortified and stronger. I think it's really important. I think that's what hard infrastructure doesn't really offer is you have to set a, a kind of ultimate benchmark and you have to set a time period. Uh, that the, the system is designed to, right? Like maybe it's 2050, maybe it's 2100. But soft infrastructure, I think, allows for more flexibility in, in many ways. It allows for uh, a kind of more indefinite systems. But I think it's also important to realize that it's not as effective on day one, right? You don't get 100% protection on day one, and that's a very, it's a very politically difficult thing to argue. Thank you very much. I don't have any more time. I have 20 more questions on my head. Uh, um, <laughs> I want to thank the, you both. Uh, they need an applause. Um, they thank you. Thank you.